interesting to see these. Okay, so we have Zan here versus Michael. So Zan, a player that has put up, I feel like, I feel like a few performances at these challenges. Zan, I believe, did very well at the first Atlanta Lacana challenge. Um, I believe might have a top eight in that one. Yeah, I know Zan has at least earned his invite to Continentals. I know he did that in Atlanta. I definitely saw him in Chicago as well. I don't think he had as much success in Chicago, but regardless, a great player having done well in both of those events. Okay, very interesting. We actually do see the point totals updated, so I was seeing 27 points. Let's look at this guy. It's going to be 43. So, i uh, sorry, 37. And we want to, I think both players might actually need to 2 of this matchup to make it into the top 64. I believe 44 was the cutoff I was hearing on the floor. Um, but that is 44 with a bubble. So play, players playing for day two here. It's very exciting. Yeah, so there's a lot of stakes here, both of them needing that 44 or 45. Well, they can't get 45, but if they win two games in this round, they'll get their seven points and can potentially bubble into day two. And then at that point, it's just winning out in day two as well. But we have a really interesting Emerald Steel versus Ruby Amethyst matchups, two of the leading decks this weekend and in the format in general. Uh, what do you think is the game plan for Zan and for Michael in this instance? So I think Zan generally wants to do the unfair things that Emerald Steel does, especially on the play, does, wants to play out that Bucky, wants to play out Diablo. Um, it is a pretty, it can be a rough matchup for Ruby Amethyst. I do think it is. It is definitely, if you looked at the metagame, you're talking about, why would I not play Ruby Amethyst? This is one of the reasons. <laughs> <laughs> this deck is pretty, it can be pretty hard to play against. That being said, Ruby Amethyst can do well against some of the more medium draws from Emerald Steel, but the very, very good draws, if you do not have that answer in the form of Brawl, can be really tough to deal with. You have to answer that Diablo immediately. Also, on top of that, Bucky with Floodborns and the Flynn Riders can just be enough. The thing is, with this Ruby Amethyst deck, it depends what's in the deck, but if you just have Brawls and you, you look at this matchup, you know your opponent's playing, you're saying, I need to find the Brawl in my opening hand, you are around 70% to find it. You're very likely to find the Brawl. If you do have access to things like Peter Pan's Shadow Finder, that actually goes up to 88% and close to 90% to find an answer to Diablo. So while it's a very impactful card, it is a devastating card. If you do not have an answer to it, you probably are going to be in a really bad spot. You can build your deck in a way that you can reliably find an answer to Diablo. And especially in a situation like this where it looks like Zan was on the play and finding that extremely strong opening of being able to play Diablo on one, Bucky on two, and then immediately shifting it on three, questing with uh, Diablo as well. Michael can't even play Brawl right now. He's behind on an ink. Absolutely. That is the best opener that Emerald Steel can have. I'm interested to see what the follow-up is here on turn three. If it's another Floodborne, it's going to be really hard uh, for Michael to deal with here. We see double turn box followers was actually not a... It's a decent one drop to have. That's that's a really tough follow-up with the Let the Storm Rage on because Zan will also draw a card here that prevents Michael from drawing a card. Michael wants to play out this turn box follower followers and then cycle them via questing and banishing them to draw the additional card. That's actually a good way to sometimes insulate against some of these uh, discard outlets. Double Bucky. Ooh. Oh, my goodness. This is just Zan's game right now. <laughs> yeah, and the strength of being able to shift to Diablo early so that you can sing some of these songs like Let the Storm Rage On, not having to pay its ink cost, being able to develop a second Bucky and to continue doing that discard game plan, that unfair game plan that you said earlier, especially into a deck that... I won't say it necessarily struggles to draw cards, but when you have the Chernobogs that need to exert and you give your opponent the opportunity to punish that by playing the Chernobogs followers, not being able to exert and banish them, I feel like Zan can just run away with this game. So very interesting as we pass over to Zan's turn. So we did, we did find the third ink in the brawl, but the thing is if Zan finds a Floodborne right here, it's going to be a really tough spot. If he does not, Michael has room to come back in this game, but a Floodborne hitting, hitting the field now surely puts Michael very, very far behind. Without that, I don't see one. I think we have a close game. Those Buckies are very threatening. They're going to be... <laughs> Michael really can't do anything about them for a while, but as long as a Floodborne doesn't hit this turn, we get more room to be able to ink and get up to that 5-6 ink. Mostly 6 ink, because you really need to have 6 ink as the Ruby Amethyst player. If you don't have 6 inks, this, uh, this Emerald Steel deck can drop something like a Beast Tragic Hero, and there's just nothing you can do about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't see any Floodborns in Zan's hand. It looked like we had a Hidden Cove, this Ursula, Deceiver of All that we saw play, and then some songs. I saw an Along Came Zeus and a Let the Storm Rage On, so even if Michael's able to develop a character or two, this Ursula might just be waiting to respond with a Let the Storm Rage On, letting Zan draw two cards off of the play, and then potentially clearing Michael's hand as, or board as well. And this is all, you know, this a lot of this is assuming that Michael actually has Inkables, which he does. We see the fourth. 
But that is uh, that is not always guaranteed with this Ruby Amethyst list. We do see a rabbit come down. That's a pretty good turn four. Michael just wants to be able to ink. Um, ooh, we see another Let the Storm Rage on. That was just what you talked about. We're going to be singing it twice. That's going to be removing the rabbit and drawing two more cards. And we do see a Donald Duck enter the hand for Zan here, which I believe is a Floodborne. Yes, absolutely is a Floodborne. If four cost it that, it's going to force Michael to discard two cards if we see it being played here. And kind of similar to a Tragic Beast. Not quite, because your opponent gets to draw a card, but sort of does the same if you thing. Have, if, you have two buckies, <laughs> if you have two buckies on the field, it is a Tragic Beast. <laughs> yeah, when you're discarding so many cards out of your opponent's hand... Sometimes your opponent doesn't even want to draw cards because they don't want them to be discarded, knowing that's the case. Michael has a couple cards in hand, but they are quickly leaving, having to choose two to discard here. Yeah, this is a really, really tough spot for Michael. Also, getting that hand sort of ripped apart at this four ink, and you can see the Madame Medusa's in hand holding those back. I mean, that's such an impactful card, but getting up to that six ink, once this discard sort of cascade starts, it's just, it's so challenging, and don't even get me started on trying to get the 7 8 to cast a Be Prepared on this board. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're at least three turns away from casting a Be Prepared, and Zan is already building an extremely powerful board with both of these Buckies. The Donald Duck having five willpower. It's a little bit weak on strength, vulnerable to some of the removal options that Ruby has available to it. But you also have this Ursula that is just sort of looming there. We saw how... Uh, Great it was for Xan to play Let the Storm Rage on earlier, being able to draw two cards off of it and deal damage to other characters. Even if Michael is able to make it to Six Ink and play a Madame Medusa, it's very likely to just be banished on the next turn. Yeah, so it does look like we have the Donald Dust Trigger, and there are four cards in hand for, for Michael here. And Xan, we know, has access to the Robin Hood, so it does have access to a Floodborne here. That's assuming that Xan also has access to an Inkable, and I believe I see an Aladdin, so he does. So definitely going to be discarding the two cards, I can only imagine, this turn. I feel like it has to be the play, right? You want to, like you said, it's so important to keep Michael from being able to come back into the game by playing and be prepared, stripping those Inkables however you can, reducing the cards from his hand, even just getting him down to two, we know that there's at least one Madame Medusa in Michael's hand, so there could be some uninkable issues there. Mm -hmm. At what point, like, what's your priority if you're Michael when you're trying to discard these cards? Uh, you hold on to the, the Madame Medusa? And, yeah, hit yeah. the Medusa. So you want to get to the six ink and you want to hit Medusa because, like, if you never get even close, like, let's say you stop at five ink, you can maybe have the out later of... You know, casting friends on the other side, finding Inkable plus Medusa, or, you know, singing friends on the other side, casting Inkable plus Medusa, and that can be okay. But then you, if you stay at that five ink and you don't get up to six or you don't get up to seven, you just completely get rid of the possibility that you can ever cast Be Prepared on a, what can be a very wide board. You need to keep yourself open to that out. That being said, we did not see any Inkables, I believe. It's double Medusa in hand, so we need Inkable off the top. Like, we need Inkable off the top, and it is a friends. Okay. So in this situation, are you. I guess you have to ink the friends because you need to play the Medusa this turn. You can't risk playing the friends and then not drawing an inkable or maybe not playing it this turn. Yeah, so I think the problem right now is, like, if you do ink the friends, and I do think that is most likely the play, is you play the Medusa and you're going to remove, what, probably this Robin Hood, maybe the Ursula, actually potentially from the Donald Duck. The Donald, yeah. yeah, because the problem is is that that second, that second Medusa in hand basically does not exist because it's almost guaranteed to get discarded. Right. Yeah. And if you do, oh yeah, because it would only be one after inking and playing the Medusa. It looks like we do play the friends. So I, I think this is a really interesting play because you're. We talked about that play line, right? We talked about inking the friends, playing the Medusa, losing the other Medusa to a discard. Are you going to win that game? Probably not. So if you <laughs> ask yourself the question of how do I win this game, it, I don't think that the answer is actually ink friends on the other side, play Medusa, and just hope. So I think you just have to keep drawing cards and keep trying to get the 7 in because I think the out to this board state is actually be prepared. It's just be prepared. I mean, is there anything else that Michael can find to pull him back into this game? Even if he does play be prepared, it looks like Xan has a relatively healthy hand. I don't see too many characters in there, which would be kind of fortunate after a be prepared. But, like, how much more grinding is Michael going to have to do if he even can find this out to get back into this game? And Xan's drawn two more cards. So... I think that it's not, like, there are ways for Michael to get out, but those ways for him to get back into the game actually exist on the top of the deck because you can't discard the top of the deck. Right. Michael's always going to draw one card, so if Michael goes runner, runner into Medusa, into Medusa, and starts to dominate the board, and then maybe finds a be prepared, and, and then, you know, top decks a Medusa after that and hits the critical beast that gets invested into, maybe. 
But we're playing. We're talking about completely playing off the top of the deck here. And we see Zan shifting a Donald Duck onto another oh. Donald Duck just to get that two discard off of the Bucky as well. And we can see just how much priority Zan is giving towards getting cards out of Michael's hand. Yep. And now Michael is in top deck mode, and be prepared is not even an out because we're sitting at that. Six ink. We go ahead and play the rabbit. That's a good one to find. Finds an inkable, but is friends on the other side. I think that you have. I think you. Well, you have to ink this friends on the other side. There's no way you can keep it in hand. It's, it's almost certainly going to be gone. Yeah, so we're looking at. Uh, we scoop it up. Yeah, we we're looking at nine lore on Zan's side of the board that turn. I think you only have one or two turns to even come back from this game. Pretty quick game, but I mean. All right. So back here, it looks like we have potentially resolved the. Hand sculpting phase. Yes, the <laughs> altars to the hand here. And interested to see. So what's funny, what sometimes, what, a card that can sometimes be innocuously impactful versus Emerald Steel is actually Flynn Rider, plus some of these uh, sort of larger attack characters. You can actually sometimes become the aggressive deck as the Ruby Amethyst player on the play. Because if you do have something like a Flynn Rider, of course they have access via single... Uh, you know, targeted removal and let the storm rage on and strike the raging fire. But Flynn Rider plus something like a Maui, like they don't have anything that, can, <laughs> that has more attack than that. And I've noticed in these Emerald Steel decks, it, they actually take two or three turns to set up. Like you have to set up Absolutely. the Bucky. If you don't have the Diablo that you can shift into immediately and sort of have uh, the strongest opening, then they're not as fast as they may seem. These Emerald Steel decks seem to be a little bit slower to build build a wide board and then can get away with it because they're stripping the opponent of their hand, right? So they can't play Be Prepared very quickly after and recover. No, you're 100% correct on that. We do see the opening with the Churn of Oxfallers. One of the key decisions for a lot of Ruby Amethyst, Amethyst decks coming into this tournament was there was there's popular builds of Ruby Amethyst that are running four one-drops in the form of just the Churn of Oxfallers, and there's also other versions that have made their way into the metagame that are running eight or are also running the Brooms. It was a very interesting sort of mm -hmm. deck-building decision a lot of these players face heading into the Lorcana Challenge in Dallas. And how important do you think it is, specifically in this matchup, of hitting your one-drop? Because I imagine that's the thing that you're weighing, right? If you are only got four one-drops, you're, of course, less likely to find them than if you're running seven or eight. And especially in a matchup here, where we know just how important drawing cards is, especially in the beginning, either through Eternal Scholars or the Magic Broom is a, another card that people like to play, you know, do you think it's worth the other cards that you're taking Ruby Amethyst for this matchup? So I think the reason that you would play the eight one drops is just to increase your ability to sort of pivot to your secondary game plan, which is bouncing, you know, bouncing your one drop back, potentially inking it, having a Madame Mim on the on the on the field, and just sort of dominating the field with these high static characters that come down early. Because your primary game plan is Flynn into Sisu. Pretty much every time. That being said, against Emerald Steel specifically, I actually don't think the one drop is too impactful. Really, you just need to find the Brawl, because if you don't have the answer to Diablo, I, I think if Diablo sticks for more than one turn, you know, it activates twice, it's very, very, very hard for you in that game. If you are going to find a one drop, the Churn of Scholars is great. It is great. Because <laughs> you, you get the quest, you get to sort of hedge your bets by putting something on the field, but you also get to dig one deeper into your deck, and that is fantastic because you're looking for very specific cards to deal with Emerald Steel. Yeah, and it seems like, especially in this matchup, sometimes you don't, you're not all that upset if you don't play a card on the first turn because you're trying to conserve cards in your hand. So rather than inking a card and then playing a card for turn, getting two out of your hand, if you miss the one drop, you know that uh, Emerald Steel is not going to come out of the gates running, so you have a couple turns to... Uh, to stabilize or to find more cards, to draw more cards, or find that brawl that you mentioned is so important to get rid of the Diablo. Yeah, that's the thing about these the one drops nowadays is they're a bit different from one drops we've seen in the metagame in the past. Like the Chernobyl's follower is just it's just a different dynamic than what used to be like an Olaf that was a one three, right? Mm -hmm. Because it is able to quest and replace itself, you don't really get punished for putting it on the field at all. I mean, there is some sort of argument about tempo, but that's not really a thing on the first turn of the game. We do see a Bucky come out here on turn two. There is no Diablo for the potential shift, but it could always come down on three. I did see a Diablo in Zan's hand, the Floodborne one, like you mentioned, not being able to be shifted, but I imagine we'll see that being played uh, on the next turn for sure to start that discard engine uh, that Bucky provides. Do you see the... Okay, we see the Maleficent Sorceress come out here. It's going to draw another card. On Friends of the Other Side on the following turn. 
back over to Zan here. Are we going to see the turn three Bucky here potentially? Or sorry, the turn three Diablo, that is. does look like we maybe drew the, the one drop Diablo off the top there as well. You know, you've mentioned the importance of a card like Brawl to get rid of the Diablo. And Bucky, of course, is also an impressive card. I think I've spotted a Beat King Undisputed in Michael's hand as well. Going into his turn four, do you think that would be it? Well, I guess it doesn't matter now because <laughs> <laughs> we're playing the Ursula Deceiver to get rid of it. Uh, but had Zan played a Diablo on turn three, like would the Bee King Undisputed have been a strong play? Maybe if you... Ha so the short answer is I think not really because... I do believe that Zan would just get rid of the Bucky and would assume that you don't have a clear answer to Diablo there. It would probably just uh, sort of exert the Diablo. Because Diablo is the real engine. Bucky is just very hard to deal with. Bucky is powerful. But Bucky is also powerful because it's almost impossible to deal with. <laughs> um, Diablo, on the other hand, is, in my opinion, arguably more powerful than Bucky. The problem is, is that you can actually interact with Diablo. If we looked at both cards individually, which one unanswered has more impact on the game? I think it's absolutely Diablo. Diablo, right. Especially because we're in the early parts of this game where Michael's trying to play cards that draw more cards. And of course, if Diablo is exerted, then every time Michael draws a card, Zan's drawing a card as well, just giving him more options to play. We do see Zan play the small Diablo. It does give him another look at Michael's hand. He got that with the Ursula, but does set up for a, bu uh, for a Diablo shift on the next turn. And important to note with that Ursula, he did snag the fence on the other side, which I think is the correct target, um, and did leave the big king on the speed. Big king on the speed is just a very clunky card in, the, in this, uh, this situation. There's no forecast on the field to actually uh, go ahead and sing that. And, um, yeah, it's a forecast on Inkable. There's no way that Michael's going to happily sort of play that and actually exert the ink to do so at this time. Might do so, but very begrudgingly. Yeah, it definitely feels like too slow of a play. We do see Michael playing another Maleficent Sorcerer to draw another card. And Michael's hand is still looking relatively healthy, especially compared to last game. He's done a pretty good job with the uh, Chernobyl's followers. And then we see, like I mentioned earlier, the double Maleficent Sorcerer is just making sure that he's keeping somewhat of a healthy hand so that this Bucky doesn't get too out of control. I think there's also a Be Prepared in there. And you mentioned last game. That's basically what you have to get to for Michael if you want a chance at winning this game at all. So I think it depends on the board state. Be Prepared is a card that I really don't like having in hand in general. Um, I do like top decking it when I have Saturday <laughs> and my opponent is, uh, is overextending onto the board or is extending onto the board. But overall, that card is just, it's actually really bad in this matchup <laughs> until, until you get to that point. Because it not only is it you can't play it and it's likely going to get discarded by this right. discard package, but it also gets snagged by Ursula. Yeah, well, that's what I was going to ask you next is, or mention next, is it is pretty scary to have early in the hand for that reason. It's not a card that you really want to see, especially when we see this play by Zan, dropping a second Bucky, shifting the Diablo, forcing Michael to discard two, and uh, I think he shifted... No, yeah, shifted with the sudden chill. So should be a double discard off of this, dwindling Michael's hand down even further. And Michael does have access to double brawl, so I'm assuming he's going to be hitting the elbow with that. But Zan, back-to-back -back games, not in the same fashion as game one, having the double Bucky into Diablo, but does find it again. And double Bucky is very tough for Ruby Amethyst to deal with. Ruby Amethyst basically can't do anything about Bucky until be prepared. Yes. Yeah, and like you mentioned, Michael has it, Michael has it at the end, or sorry, Michael has uh, Be Prepared in hand, but as you mentioned earlier, that might not always be a good thing because Zan can definitely take uh, advantage of that if he can play around it through something like an Ursula Deceiver. So, Or even just with the, the massive discard that you have with Bucky, if Michael gets too low on his hand, Zan might be able to come out and just have him discard it without using an Ursula at all. Yeah, we do see that brawl played out, and I do see Zan has access to Beast Tragic Hero in hand. If Zan is able to make Michael sort of discard so many cards again and not have access to that ink, we could be in a pretty tough position. That being said, Michael is at five ink now, so only has to ink one more kind of fun card to find the Medusa that could potentially deal with the beast that comes down. Beast is just one of those cards where it's like when you have the clear answer, when you're on the play, it's a very reasonable card. When you're on the draw and you're being forced to discard, you don't have access to ink, Beast is one of the scariest cards in the game. The play draw differential and Beast's impact specifically is very significant. Yes, and we'll see that Zan play a Donald Duck uh, instead of the Beast, it looks like. And Michael inking a Brawl. I saw Madame Medusa in hand. I think it's a Rabbit as well. Just taking a look, it looks like a Be Prepared Rabbit. And then you said Madame Medusa. And I, yeah, I, I see yeah. that there as well. So Donald Duck down here. And are we... 
Are we resolving the discard at this point? I think so. Back here? I think Michael is trying to decide what we're discarding out of this hand. <laughs> so, um, do you, if you could Maybe. run me through what you think he's thinking about in regards to that discard. I mean, so mm -hmm. we've, we've talked about how important Be Prepared is, especially getting back into this game. There's double Bucky's down. If you can get a Be Prepared off, you can potentially come back from the game, but that's at least... Uh, Two turns away, or it looks like this might still be Michael's turn. Maybe we're not resolving the uh, the the Donald. I can't tell, but regardless, ink is so important in this matchup, right? And none of these cards are inkable if this is a rabbit medusa and be prepared. So I think right now, Michael's having to think of his outs and what he can even get to. I feel like we're in a relatively similar situation as before, where you can keep him out of Medusa. Hope you make it to six ink and play it, but then you're just getting rid of a Donald Duck. The Buckies and the Ursus are still going to be there. Zan is going to have a relatively sizable hand or at least have a bit of an advantage on you. And you're kind of at the mercy of your top decks uh, with inking. If you keep the Rabbit, you can potentially draw extra cards and find those inkable cards, which I think is a, man, is a must. <laughs> yeah. So if we were to extrapolate Michael's decisions in the previous game, Michael opted to keep the card draw over the Medusa. You know, could keep the Medusa top deck and inkable, go ahead and remove uh, that Donald Duck, which is a very, very relevant threat at this point, uh, but does opt to keep the Rabbit to try to get that more, get more ink because maybe recognizes once again that I need to get up to a higher ink total in order to potentially even have be prepared as an out if Zan keeps overextending into this board. So it's really, it's actually a really interesting choice. I don't think the be prepared is a reasonable keep there because you will discard it most likely. And you're actually, although you are at five ink, you are very far away from that right. card. Um, it's really the Medusa versus the Rabbit. And I think Michael has shown us, you know, expert play so far as to which card to keep and has opted to keep the, the card draw over the sort of impactful two-for-one threat that he would also need to top deck an ink for it to even play. Because if he doesn't top deck an ink, it's devastating. Like, it's probably game losing. Yeah, and we see that pay off with Michael playing the Rabbit, drawing a Maui, being able to immediately ink it, and then this turn he gets to draw a card again potentially inking that, or when it comes back to his turn, gets to ink that as well, and then we're getting a little bit closer to some of the answers we need. Michael having six ink currently in his ink well just needs one more ink off the top, and then at that point, I feel like you're just crossing your fingers and hoping to find another be prepared. Yeah, so it does look like Zan has access to the Floodborne as well. And Michael only has two cards in hand, so if we see a Floodborne come down, both cards are going to go into the discard. And that is the one that you do not want to see. <laughs> Yeah, Beast needs very specific answers uh, from a Ruby Amethyst deck, and we've already seen at least one Meta Medusa, maybe more, go into the discard already, which is the primary answer for Tragic Beast. So it's not looking great for Michael. Yep, we are getting close to the stage where it does feel like Michael needs to go ahead and top deck a Medusa here. Um, could obviously draw some card draw, you know, like Friends on the Other Side, sing Friends on the Other Side, go ahead and find it. It does find a Flynn Rider and does opt to ink it, which is very interesting. If you're looking at this, you're like, why are you inking it? Why not play it onto the field? You know, maybe you can top deck a Maui later and you can actually utilize this. We're playing towards that very specific out. <laughs> yeah, I love that term, playing to your outs. I think it's a great thing for newer players coming into this game to learn early because this is what separates the best players from the good players or the great players. Michael understands that he needs to have seven ink in his ink well so that if he does top this be top deck, a be prepared, which is basically the only thing that he can do at this point to come back from this game and even have uh, a chance at winning, uh, you have to have that ink in your inkwell. The Flynn Rider's not going to do too much for you because none of your characters have more strength on the board than your opponent. And even if they did, uh, Zan has uh, options in his hand very likely to remove that Flynn Rider as well through songs. Yeah, interesting. I think I might have missed something. I saw Zan, I believe, draw three cards, and then I didn't see Michael draw a card, which would have been the symmetrical trigger off of Donald Duck. Because you have the trigger off the beast, you have your trigger draw for turn, and then the Donald Duck is symmetrical. Obviously, that card would have been uh, discarded anyway. It does look like we've run into a little bit of... Okay, okay. here we go. And there we <laughs> Michael looking through his discard, seeing what he still has. Uh, I believe this is still the beginning of Zan's turn. Mm -hmm. Zan just drew cards for the turn. I could have, I could have not seen, and he could have drawn two cards and said opted to not trigger that Donald Duck. Um, but you would think that he would want to because that card would almost certainly be discarded uh, with the access to the flood, uh, multiple floodborns in hand. We do see Diablo there. 
as well as the Flynn. The Flynn Rider, particularly powerful. The Emerald Flynn Rider going to be questing for four every single turn, most likely from this board state. Yes, I love the Flynn Rider. We do see an Along Came Zeus being sung with Beach Tragic Hero to get rid of the rabbit, denying mm -hmm. Michael an opportunity yeah. to potentially draw a bounce card, utilize the rabbit to draw extra cards uh, on the previous turn. Okay, so I think that turn. Michael is um, opting to deny the May trigger of the draw because it is so incredibly like it's so <laughs> clear that it is so clear that um, those cards will be discarded, which is Interesting. I'm trying to think out if I'm missing something gonna, in regards to the game theory on why you would... Um, I was going to ask you if you thought, deck you know, what you think about that play of is it better to just go ahead and draw the card, maybe get you closer to the card that you need, but you also have the chance of drawing the card you need, which is well, more, more than likely to be discarded. So the top of the deck in a game like this is equal to the bottom of the deck. All cards are equally likely and unlikely to be the same card mm -hmm. uh, or any card in the deck. So, I, I, I mean, theoretically, I guess it doesn't matter in that sense. Um... So yeah, because all of those cards are unknown, so they're all uh, they're all equal. So we do see it was just a turn of bug followers off the top. Michael's gonna opt to play that, of course. Why not? Otherwise, it just gets discarded. He doesn't need to ink anything more because we know he has seven ink, and that should be about where his deck maxes out in regards to playable cards. Trying to decide, it looks like if he wants to challenge any of Zan's characters, quest or just keep him left and readied. Okay, it does look like. Uh, challenging into the beast here to stop the additional draw trigger that is on Zan's turn. So Zan draws for turn, draws for Donald Duck. It looks like Michael opts to not draw there. This is why I love the Donald Duck in this matchup. And I mentioned earlier, it's basically like another tragic beast because when you have those Buckies in play, Michael drawing a card it is sort of fruitless. You know that there's two Buckies on board. Zan has a giant hand of cards right now. The statistics are that there's another Floodborn in there and whatever card you draw is just going to get discarded. So Zan's really thinking about one here, which is one thing here, which is how do I insulate against the Be Prepared? Um, that could be, you know, potentially not committing, over committing to board, but it also means that Zan probably wants to remove this turn of box followers and not uh, not allow it to quest and replace itself. Because if that happens, it gives Michael two draws to find the be prepared. And I'm not sure that Zan is in a scenario where he really needs to overextend. Right now, it looks like there's seven lore currently on board. So, sort of regardless of if he adds extra lore, he's going to win the game in two turns. If nothing else changes, he'd have to add uh, significantly more lore in order to reduce that to you know only being one turn until he loses and between the one and two turns i mean technically michael may get one or two more chances to find to be prepared and play it but also by not overextending zan still has all those cards in his hand he can just play immediately after the be prepared and still threaten something similar yep you're absolutely right you can do the math on sort of the amount of turns it will take to threaten game and if that is not going to decrease by adding more to the board or adding significantly more to the board it can be better to not do so in order to insulate yourself against the be prepared and sort of keep the turn clock the same as it would be anyway. It does go to Zian's turn. He's going to draw for turn and draw off the Donald Duck again. Michael opting not to draw a card after having just uh, drawn a Merlin Goat, it looks like, and playing that. I think he also inked a Queen's Castle as well. Yes. Is forced to ink a card and play a card there again because we're facing the dynamic of one of these cards will be discarded. Um, and only an access to seven ink, not eight, so could not play both of them. And we're going to go ahead and take a look at the hand here. <laughs> <laughs> ha, thank oh, you. okay. So Michael so. just flips the goat. Not to be prepared. Really the only thing that gets him out of this. And it looks like Zan is going to take this 2-0. Yep. Up to 44 points. That is uh, the 